Contrary to popular belief, online learning hasn't faded entirely after the COVID-19 pandemic. WGLT's Lindsay Jones reports on how online courses are becoming a part of higher education strategic plans ahead of a looming drop in students. If you were in school yourself or were the parents of school-age kids, then you probably remember well what it was like when education shifted entirely online back in 2020. Efforts to curb the spread of COVID-19 led schools across the country to close their doors and move learning to online platforms only. And if you remember all of this, then you probably remember the dialogue surrounding it too. Lots of talk about getting, quote unquote, back to normal. I get tense like a cat. My heckles go up when I hear that. Return to normal, back to normal. That's Kate Harold Brown. She's the director of online learning and instructional technology at Heartland Community College in Normal. I don't get upset about a lot of things, but that is a phrase that that really upsets me because what back to normal? And Harold Brown is not the only person to feel this way about online education. Tony Pena is Illinois State University's chief online education officer, a position that's relatively new to ISU. A lot of what happened during COVID wasn't really what I would call online education. I'd call it emergency remote teaching. Brown and Pena are both higher ed professionals working in a space that's actually been in development for a long time. Brown remembers the early days of remote or quasi-online learning from her own classwork about 20 years ago. She'd drive to a college library, put a VHS tape into a player, and then take an exam based off the video she watched. That wasn't online learning necessarily, but I do remember I registered for that by logging into a system. I corresponded with my instructor by email. You know, some of those foundational pieces that we probably just take for granted as part of online learning were not new even in the early 2000s. Pena's experience with online learning goes back even further. I've been in the field of educational technology for a long time, Uh, since 1987. And I started working with distance education, with video conference education, 30 years ago and built my first online class in uh, 1997. All of this is to say that forms of online or remote learning have been in development for decades. And for all of the talk of a so-called return to normal, online classes have remained a consistent holdover from the days of fully remote learning three and four years ago. At a national level, the numbers bear this out. Data from the Federal Department of Education in 2022 showed that 54% of college students were taking one or more courses online. That's a nearly 50% jump from 2019. ISU's Tony Pena says the percentage of college students with at least one online course had been growing about 2% every year since the 2000s before it rocketed recently. We would have have expected it to be about 43% of students, but it's 10 points higher than that. And that was due really to a spike that occurred during, uh, during the COVID years. At Heartland Community College, Kate Harold Brown says 45% of students there are taking at least one online class, suggesting a continued demand. If students didn't want these courses, they wouldn't be enrolling in them even if we offered them. So yes, students definitely want that online experience. At ISU, the percentage of students with one or more online classes is pretty low, around 4%. Here's Pena again. ISU has been very successful at being a university for what we would call traditional students. Mm -hmm. Students who are here to study full time, students who either live on campus or live close to campus and are going to spend their time here. Like many other higher ed institutions, ISU is preparing for an eventual drop in potential students. The term for that phenomenon is enrollment cliff. It refers to when the number of graduating high schoolers begins to drop sharply in 2025 a byproduct of lowered birth rates starting in 2008. So instead of online learning fading out after a return to in-person classes post-COVID, some colleges and universities are leaning into it, seeing it as an additional source of revenue. And that's why Tony Pena was hired in 2022 for a position that had not yet existed at ISU before. And we're looking at, at uh, online and, um, and adult education professional development, micro-credentials as part of a strategy to diversify. And with online learning, a relatively unexplored territory, Pena says ISU is seeking new markets for its education. Employed students, um, 
people who started college and didn't finish and students from outside of the U.S. There is a large untapped market for us. To that end, ISU is developing brand new fully online master's degree programs in public health, actuarial science, and sports management. Pena says it's easier to develop master's programs, which is why that's where ISU is starting, but eventually it may expand to some fully online bachelor's degree programs as well. Professional certifications and micro-credentialing programs are also being developed. At Heartland, Kate Harold Brown says access continues to be an emphasis for the community college that serves three counties. But I think when you're talking about education, there's a commitment that you make to your students that you will meet them where they're at. And if that's at home, that's what online learning does. But she says the strategic vision for Heartland as an institution may differ from others that may be specifically looking to push online even more. It's not necessarily about expanding, you know, how many sections that we offer that are online or how many students we can we can reach. It's more, you know, what are we doing correctly to maintain that 45%. What are students enjoying about these classes? What are our learning outcomes? But is online learning somehow worse or lesser than in person? A number of articles and studies have taken various stances on this and produced various results, all of them depending on specific variables. Heartland's Harold Brown and Pena of ISU say they dispute blanket statements that suggest in-person learning is always superior for students, or that education always suffers when it's delivered online, whether that's live on Zoom or in other ways. Here's Harold Brown. How can we innovate? How can we go deeper into the style of teaching that makes this experience really, really meaningful? There, there are some folks who just think that's not possible for online learning, but I, I don't believe that. I, I truly believe that online learning is and can be the best of both worlds. And here's Tony Pena from ISU. Things that are used in the literature as proxies for learning are not learning. Pena says studies tend to measure one thing and code that thing as a measurement of learning, like whether a student drops out of a course or whether their GPA fluctuates when online classes are added. Pena says done well, remote or online learning outcomes can be just as good as in-person instruction. Because it's not the delivery system that makes a difference. It is how it's being taught, the teaching methods, the motivation of the students and all. Those are the things that make a, uh, that, uh, make a difference. The extent to which a university or college successfully leans into online programming that produces good outcomes for students will have a direct tie into how successful its wraparound supports are. I'm Lindsay Jones. You can read this full story online at WGLT.org.